Okay, everyone, well, welcome to our One World Energy Encounter with the Zohar. This week's portion is Vayigash, and uh, it's in our volume six. Verse one is where we will be. In my book, it's 277, page 277. So let's invite in the lineage of Kabbalists, the Rav and Karen, and Michael, Rav Shlag, Rav Brandwein, the Ria Kodesh, the Ramchal, Rabbi Tafon, Rav Rav Mzulai, Rav Menachem Mendel Levitebsk, Rav Kolon Shapira Piasetza, the Baal Shem Tov, Rav Shulam Vayachai, and all the students, Rav Mordechai of Chernobyl, one soul with Yosef at Tzadik in Shechem. Um, also, it is the anniversary of elevation of Rav Yaakov Wolf Franz, the Magid of Dubna. Oh, that's not right. No. Today is the anniversary elevation of Zachariah the prophet, Malachi the prophet, and Rav Meir Shalom of Kolshin. So we have their assistance today. Also, it's the 10th day of Tibet of Capricorn, and a lot of places, not us, there's a, is a, it is the day when Nebuchadnezzar breached the walls of the temple prior to the destruction of the temple. And so uh, in, in, on, on the Kabbalistic calendar, it's definitely a noteworthy day. Um, since we're beyond midday, we also have the energy of Shabbat already infusing our world. So we have that benefiting us. And uh, But we want to think about and draw the consciousness and the energy from the upper realm of Havat Chinam, unconditional love, treating everyone with human decency, energy of healing for all those we know healing, uh, specifically those who are are have been impacted by the war in the Middle East, return of all the hostages, protection from energy of protection for the soldiers and everyone else need protection. Also, the energy of moving that negativity from our world and uh, protection from evil eye and evil speech. Okay. So also an end to the conflict in Israel. So um, let's let's start. We're again we're at verse one. And by way of background, this is the third in the three portions that deal with the life of Joseph. And at this point, he's the second most powerful person in Egypt. He's viceroy of Egypt, and he controls all the physical sustenance. And so for us, on a very deep level, he is the channel for the, the Svira of Yisod, through which all physical and spiritual sustenance reaches our world. And his journey, we've been charting over the past three weeks, what it's taken to get to this point, it, 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 was a, it was an arduous journey. I mean, it required a lot of work. It was faced with a lot of challenges, sold into slavery, thrown into prison. Eventually, he finds his way out, and and he ascends to his current role. So, for us, it's also very instructive about all the challenge the challenges we have in our life and our own spiritual and physical journeys. Um, that's one part of it. The other part of it is, though, at this point, the brothers. Are in Egypt looking for food, and um, there's a conflict. Joseph is threatening to take his brother. They don't realize it's Joseph, of course, the brothers, and he's threatening to take Benjamin captive. Interestingly enough, because he he wants to protect him, he he, want, he doesn't he doesn't believe that he's safe with the brothers because the same brothers that sold them to slavery. So a conflict ensues between Judah, who's the leader of the brothers who had, it was willing to stick his neck out to protect Benjamin. And so that reassures jo Joseph that the brothers have corrected for their selling him into slavery. So there's a huge tikkun, it's a huge correction that takes place. And also one of the most dramatic stories in all the Bible, because it's this represents this reunification of the brothers with Joseph. So let's dive in. Verse one. By Yigashi Lav Yehuda Vagomer, Rabbi Elazar Patach, Kiata Avinu, Ki Abraham Lo Yadanu, Vistrael Lo Yaki Renu, Ata Shem Avinu, Gualena Me Alam Shemecha, Haikra Okmuha, Abal Tahaze, Kadbara Kuchabrihu Alma, Kol Yoma Vyoma, Abed Avidata Kika Haze, the Koyoma Vyoma Kamad eats to Rih, Kevin the Ata Yomash Tita. 
the it's tarikh le mibre adam atat oraita kame amra hai adam de at ba e le mibre zamin hu la argaza kamach al male il male la tarikh rugza tab le de la it bre amar le kershbarhu de khil magana it karena erach apain. Then Yudah came near him. Rabbi Eliezer opened a discussion with the verse, you are our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. You, Hashem, are our father, our redeemer. Your name is from everlasting. Okay, and that's a verse from Yeshaya. So we have this verse, the opening verse of this week's portion, and Judah came near, that's what Vayikash means, to him, to Joseph. So he's confronting him. So just for the record, this is a big week with confrontation. So if you've had any confrontations, it's 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 the prevailing energy. It's it the energy of confrontation is there this week. The issue becomes how do we deal with it if we're or if we're confronted, or alternatively. How do we handle situation when we need to be confrontational? That's what's going on here. And it's not a story. We're not studying history here. We're studying present moment relevance. So what relevance in our present moment does this section have? So in order to assist us with that, Rabbi Elazar brings down a verse from the prophet Yeshaya. And um, which really discusses the relationship that we have with the Creator. So one of the first things to take away from this is the importance of thinking about our relationship with the Creator. Now, I don't know about you guys, but it's hard to have a relationship with um, something that's not physical, right? I mean, it's easy to have a relation. Well, it's not even so easy to have a relation with people, but at least with people, we have there's an interaction, there's a give and a take. We get feedback. But how do we have a relationship with the light, with the Creator? I mean, can I have a comment? I can talk to the Creator, but am I going to get messages back? Am I hearing anything? So it's hard to have a relationship when it seems one way, doesn't it? So, on a 1% level, yeah, it does seem one way, but in a much deeper way, part of what we want to open our consciousness up to is this idea that everything that's happening in our life is part of the conversation we're having with the Creator. 24-7. And that aligns pretty well with what's going on with Joseph and his brothers. Like they're having a conversation too. It doesn't seem up to this point that Joseph's actually been listening to his brothers, but he has a bigger plan, which is I, he wants to make sure his brother is safe. They sold him. What's to stop them from exploiting Benjamin? Okay, let's keep going. Wait, David, just a quick technical question. Yeah. The very line says it's from Bereshit. So is it the same? Is in Vayigash, meaning when it says it came near to him, is it this same event that we're talking about? Yes. So that verse from Breshit, the first line there, is the opening line to this week's portion. Vayigash elav Yuda. So when when the last week's portion ended, Joseph's like, hey, you know, he set it up, Joseph did. He had his, his uh, assistants place something of value in Benjamin's... Um, camel and uh he had his guards then as they were leaving he had his guards accost them find the stolen stolen i say in air quotes item and bring them all back and said and joseph said listen i'm keeping him he stole something i'm throwing him in jail but you guys are free to leave with the food and you know whatever and uh so they could have left benjamin it was a win-win for joseph because at least he at that point had benjamin in custody so he knew he had him saved and the only question was, 
where were the brothers going to fall on this? Were they going to stand up for the brother? Benjamin, their half brother. Or were they going to, you know, say, oh, we're, we got to take care of ourselves. So it's this huge showdown. So that's how it ends up last week. This week literally opens with Judah, who is not the oldest brother. But Judah stands up when before he had, uh, when they sold Joseph, he really hadn't taken the responsibility to stand up. So again, you know, what we, what we get is we get a stronger backbone here to stand up for what our truth is, to figure out what our truth is and to stand up for our truth. Not, you know, not thinking about the consequences. We have to stand up. We have to find our truth. We have to speak our truth. We have to live our truth, which is what you, Judah does here. He does a huge correction. And that's why we're here, to also discover our truth and live our truth. So, okay, keep going. This verse was already explained, yet come and behold. When the so Holy like, I just want to say that the Zohar, it's an off written line. This has already been explained. Probably it was explained in a different Zohar. So like, what relevance is it to us? And again, at a very deep level, we know this. Our soul already knows this. So when we see that line, it's a reminder to us that we're not learning something for the first time. Our soul already has access to this consciousness. Go ahead. When the Holy One blessed be, he created the world. He did each day for work, befitting, befitting it. When the sixth day arrived, the time for Adam to be created, the Torah came before him and said, Adam, whom you want to create will provoke you. Unless you curb your wrath, it would be better for him not to be created. If okay, want so, so, it's fascinating. That, like, how does this relate to confrontation? Well, we're going back to the creation story. We're literally going back to the seed level of reality here. And what the Zohar is telling us is the creator created the world, and on the sixth day, he finished creating it, and this, as the story goes, on the seventh day, he rested. But what the Zohar is telling us is that the, the Torah came, I mean, I'm, you know, picture like, you know, a, a scroll walking up to the Torah. I mean, is that what it was? Walking up to the creator and saying, hey, before you create Adam, something you might want to consider. Like, what is that? What, what does it mean the Torah, it sounds like the Torah is confronting the creator. So again, to a certain degree, this is a it's, a, it's an anthropomorphism. Not that it doesn't really happen. It's just that how it's, it's being explained to us in human terms. So what this represents, I mean, it represents, there's a lot of deep wisdom here, but at one level, what it represents is this conflict between the creator and what he created. The Torah is of the creator. So how can they not be perfectly aligned? How can there be some kind of conflict? And when you see what the Torah is purporting to be saying, is like, don't create Adam because he's just going to mess up and upset you. This is a lot of a lot of questions we can ask about this, but at a certain level, it's like, it is another confrontation between the creator and his wisdom. And again, it's like the wisdom of the creator, what's the wisdom of the creator? Well, it's unlimited, but it is in, in, in as it's represented in the Torah which is what we're studying right now. So there's a lot you can really say about this, just in terms of it's paradoxical. But I just, I wanna focus on the fact that it, it represents a confrontation and represents this idea that 
in the in the creation, why did and this is a question that came up this week in a different class? Why did the creator create the world? For kicks? <laughs> why did the creator create the world? Was it because the creator needed something? The creator doesn't need anything. By definition, the creator is 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 complete, is full. The creator isn't in need of anything. It was us, the receivers, who needed. We wanted to earn the light. We didn't want to be receiving light without making an effort and feeling like bread of shame, feeling like we, we didn't do anything to deserve this. We wanted to feel like we deserve it. So that's, in part, the basis of the creation of this world. It's a realm where we can earn the light. Hey, David, but, I just want to, may, may I, I just want to point out, I mean, I love where you're going. I just want to say that looking at the line that the Torah came before him, I feel like that's the first line where it says the truth of the Torah, right? That the Torah, in other words, how, how, as you, as you pointed out, as you're saying, the Torah already exists. It always exists. And we always, people always say, where did it come from? Who wrote it? Well, I'm just saying, you should read that. It's all, it was already there. I mean, how could it come before the creator? Before creation. Before, yeah. So how could it? What, what do you think? What do you think? Again, God created everything. So I don't know which day of his creation it came into being. I mean, to a certain degree, the, the Torah just represents an aspect of the creator. The creator's energy before creation and this is you know the teachings of rav isaac luria before creation the creator's energy was in equal proportions all across reality when we the receivers said wait a second we don't want to keep receiving life for anything we want to earn it there was the great restriction that seemed to him so but everything still has the energy of the light of the creator in it. Torah represents this very elevated energy of the creator. So it was always there. It was always there. I just want to share, if I may. I've been, staring, I've been staring out my window. There literally is the most beautiful cardinal that's been sitting here for something approaching 10 minutes. No bird sits for 30 seconds. And he's just listening to us. We're clearly generating light that he wants to hear. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That's very cool, Peter. That's Thank unbelievable. You. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So, again, like this energy of the Torah is an aspect of the creator. So, to a certain degree, it's the creator having a conversation with the creator. But to also, to a certain degree, it's like the Torah becomes this blueprint for our reality. And it also represents this like gift to us to assist us on the journey here. Okay, so we say, look, we want the ability to earn the light. And the creator's like, fine, here's your reality. But we're not totally left alone. We're given some tools. And one of the biggest tools is the Torah. It's the blueprint for this reality. So the more we understand about this reality, the more we can earn the light that we wanted to earn that assists us in earning the light. Now, if you're gonna do something to earn the light, correspondingly, you must be able to do things to disconnect from the light. <laughs> and so what the Torah is saying is, you, Adam, who you wanna create will provoke you unless you curb your wrath, it'd be better for not to cream at all. You would be better if you weren't, if you weren't created. In other words, like there's, there's a cause and effect in this world. And so if you create Adam and he's going to like run off course, the effect is just going to wipe him out. So why bother with that? Why bother doing something if you know it's going to fail? Isn't that what the conversation is here, really? So before we get to the creator's answer, just consider that in our lives, 
we almost also may look at hopeless situations. But that's a 1% reality. That's a 1% consciousness. Because everything is possible. Anything is possible. We just, we, but we have to ask. Judah is dealing with most power, the, the, the second most powerful person in the world at the time, Joseph. And he's going to stand up for Benjamin. But he realizes the odds are stacked against him. Why would Joseph release Benjamin when he's guilty of stealing his wine glass or whatever it was? Why, why would the, sec the, the second most powerful man in the world listen to Judah? What's he going to say? Why would he care? But he does it anyhow. And this underscores for us doing things, having a consciousness beyond logic. Certainty beyond logic. I mean, our teachers call it certainty beyond logic, but you know, it's certainty in the light, but it's like we're doing things that are illogical. We, and the reason why it's important to understand that distinction is because that's the two trees we have at our disposal. The tree of knowledge of good of evil, which is the one we took the bite of the apple of, and and in some levels, we're always we continue to take bites out of that apple. We're buying into this vision of reality where the you know who you know how you enhance uh, things by knowing information, by knowing what's right and knowing what's wrong. I mean, at a certain level, yes. Another level, that's not what determines our reality. That's one percent. It's the tree of life. That's the other ninety nine percent. That's where we want to be connect connected to. And so this dialogue at a certain level between Judah and Joseph and between the Torah and the Creator is helping us rise above the illusion of physicality, the 1% realm. I see all kinds of terrible things going on in the world. I know. But that is an illusion. That's the 1% realm. So one of the huge benefits we have in studying this paragraph is assistance in elevating our consciousness and seeing the difference between when we're in a lower consciousness and when we're in an elevated consciousness. We're here. We've strapped on this bodysuit. And when you when you are wearing this bodysuit, you're, you're tapping into the 1% reality in a very big way, in a much bigger way than you have the opportunity tap into the 99%. So we're always doing work to see that deeper reality. And that's that's what's going on here. Okay, so we don't have Joseph's response to Judy here, but we do have the creator's response to the Torah. You're gonna, the Torah says, look, you're gonna create Adam, but he's gonna disappoint me and you're gonna get upset and you're gonna, you know, Better not to create them than to create something that you're going to be upset with. And what's the creator say in response? Go ahead and read. The Holy One, blessed be he, ask, am I called long-suffering for no reason? So in typical fashion, he answers the question with another question. <laughs> that must be where this comes from. This tendency because <laughs> it, it's right there what does that answer mean am i not long suffering uh, so the, on one level the, the creator is saying i'm a patient guy i can deal with you know the malfeasances of my creator i can totally deal with that but on a much deeper level what the creator is saying is i'm going to give them the opportunity to correct their ways yes there's going to be an environment for them to earn the light. And yes, they're going to get off the path, but they will have time to do tshuva, to correct for that. And that is what is going on in our life. So like when you make a mistake, stop beating yourself up. We were programmed for these mistakes at the seed level. When we beat ourselves up for our mistakes, we're giving our light over to the other side. 
And so the, the, the next benefit that we get in this paragraph is more self-care. It's a, great, a deeper appreciation for, we're gonna, of course we're gonna make mistakes. That's the way this world is wired. And the more perfection we, we strive for, the more potential disappointment we're setting ourselves up for. There's a business consultant I work with and one of his big deals is like, don't try to get 100%, try to get 80. Just shoot for 80. That's pretty good, getting 80% of the task done. And then when you're there, so okay, now you have 20% remaining, so now just try and get 80% of that done. So we're oh, this is the journey, it's what it's about. We are here on a journey. Everybody that's here is on a journey of correction of opening up their soul, of manifesting the best version of, their, of themselves. And that's what Judah is doing here. Judah had a correction, as did the other brothers. And they begin to realize that that's what's going on. And so again, for us, it's a reminder, we're also on a journey. And we're not here to get everything right. We're here to be on the journey and moving in the right direction. That's, that is... That's why we're here. That's why the world was created. And that's everybody's destiny. Everybody is working on that. Okay, let's continue. Verse two. I just want to say before we read the English that um, the weird thing about I was going to study a completely different Zohar and then I just got this message to do this one. And then I realized that earlier this week in a class I was teaching to beginning students, one of the students asked, why did the creator create the world? It actually may not have been, a I don't know what class was it, it was in actually. It may not have been the beginning class. I don't remember. And, and here's the answer. Okay, Maria, first two. All was created to the medium of the Torah and constructed by means of the Torah. And as the Torah being begins with the letter Bet, so was the world created with the letter Bet. For before the Holy One blessed be, he created the world, the Nukka, all the letters were presented before him one by one in reverse order. Okay, so we're back to Actually, there was a discussion between the Creator and the Torah. Now we're back to like, what is Torah? Like, what is that? And again, it's like, for most of the world, it's the five books of Moses. It's the Old Testament. It's just literature described as, you know, providing the world with ethical and moral guidelines. Is that all that it is? So well, the Zohar has told us in other places that's not all that it is. It's, it's, and it's an system to let us access the flawless universe. It's a, it's a the blueprint for reality. It's access points for the flawless universe, and it's one of the primary tools to assist us in elevating our consciousness. If you look at it like literature. It's not elevating your consciousness. I mean, look, a good book, you know, could elevate your consciousness. <laughs> but that's not what this is. It's not a good book. It's the good book. It is energy of elevation. Hey, and, David. Yes. I, I assume I may not be alone, but I'm owning it for myself. It's it's easier to have the belief, faith, whatever word you want to use, that there is a creator than it is to think that the letters are the energy of the world. A hundred percent, right? Like, let's talk about that. I'm glad you brought that up. And, and the reason why it's important because it, it, it does shape our consciousness. Like, okay, I'm buying into that there's a world beyond the physical world and that there's an energy force that is unseen, an energy intelligence that's unseen. 
All right, I'm willing. I think I'm willing to buy into that. But the letters, what the letters are? What does it mean? The letters are like holy. What does that mean? Even it's letters. So it's it's next level consciousness, and it's not an easy one. It's like you know, and I, I you know, to Peter's point, I mean, I think we all have. I, I would say doubt, but let's call it a lack of certainty about that. So I want to use the example of a photograph. Like think of a photograph that conjures up emotions. What exactly is going on? It's pixels on paper. It's just color on paper. What makes that, what is it about that picture that elicits an emotional response? It could be the picture of, a, of, of the water on the beach. It could be the picture of a parent, a partner, a child, a grandchild. I mean, I'm just saying grandchildren's pictures are the biggest. Number. But like, it could be anything. It could be a picture of a historical figure. Like, what is it about the picture that creates an emotional stirring. It's subjective. It it's is different subjective. for all of us. You know, it, it either it's a memory or it's a desire or. What, Maria? Is that energy that carries? It's energy. There's energy coming. There's, there's an energy, energetic connection there. And you're right. It is subjective, except. It's objective in that we all have those subjective influences. They're going to be not the same for us. Rest assured, my grandkid isn't going to look like to you the way it looks to me. <laughs> but that underscores the fragmented nature of reality. And there are certain pictures that we will all have reactions to. And when we don't have the react, well, what about a picture that's like so heartwarming, but I don't feel it? The whole world, you know, not a, whole, a bunch of people looking like, oh my God, look at that picture. And I don't feel it. What's going on? Something wrong with me? No, nothing wrong. <laughs> but there's a blockage. <laughs> That's funny you're talking about pictures because I experienced the pictures this week. It's funny with my sister, my older sister, who is came from South America, went to Florida visiting her son, who's my godson, and I haven't seen him for years. Um and they were, in, they were a university student. They took pictures and she sent me pictures, right? Of that, this was like Sunday night. And it just gave me that emotion because I haven't seen him for so long. And oh. all I communicate with him is happy birthday for his birthday. So I remember that much. But at the same time, my sister and we were just talking about how great it is to see you did it and the kid and the kids and so forth. And for some reason, because my grandfather passed this month, she turned around on the same, she goes, oh, we need to remember our grandfather. And because I have such a not too happy memory with my grandfather, there we go. The second, the second comment that you made when it's just not that welcoming picture, I just like, it gave me a completely different emotion. I didn't care for the picture. I just like, and I didn't care to carry conversation about right. that particular picture. So it's fascinating because it's different energy coming from different yeah. pictures, but ultimately it's just color on a piece of paper. Right. Well, that's so, why it's subjective. That's right. why it is subject. It is subjective, except it's subjective. Except the experiences are universal. We will all have reactions to photos. I want to. Can we photos. can we use a different word than subjective? I understand why you're saying that because you're saying each one of us has a different reaction. Want to say but, it's personal? No, no. But the point is, if we think about what happens when we see, and look, it's the same thing with a joke. It doesn't even have to be a picture. When one thing, when we react. We all end up reacting differently, and it's based on our filter and our experiences, right? So when Maria says that, the example she's giving is her sister has a positive experience or memory of her grandfather, and she doesn't. So that's what it conjures up. So it's not that it's subjective. It's that it's whatever's been wired into us from our physical 1% experiences with, you know, why do you know why do I cry over movies and my brother never does, right? Right? So what is it that's happened in you know in us individually that has 
put us in a position to react, react, right? I think react the way we are when we see that picture or what, or hear that joke or whatever. Well, what about yeah. perception? You like that better than subjective? Our perception? No? no? I mean, I think it's personal because a lot of those pictures are like, it's like family. Yeah. It could be family was that, you know, it was just pure and innocent or family that is less pure and let, we perceive them to be less pure and less innocent. But I want to take, I want to use that as a, as a uh, launch, a springboard into this other idea. So I have a picture, which I'm very emotional about. And then I have the picture of the letter Aleph. I mean, I'm looking at them. I'm not feeling anything with the Aleph. What's going on? So on a 1% level, there are emotions. There's an emotional energy. There's an emotional energetic response to the picture of the person. To the picture of the Aleph, your soul is responding to that. It's a much more elevated, energetic connection that we lack the ability to completely perceive. Now, if you take those letters, those same Aleph, Bet, Gimel, all those letters, all the entire 22 letters of the Aramaic alphabet, and you mix it up, and it tells the story of Joseph and his brothers, this week, the re the, when they re reunite, it's a tearjerker. Read it in English. There is emotion embedded in that story. And that the, the transfer of that energy is coming through the Hebrew letters. You can read it in English and still feel that. Your soul, though, feels it in a much deeper way when it's your the Aramaic letters that you're connecting to. And so what stands in the way of our connecting to the deepest energetic channels is consciousness, our limitation of consciousness, and our limitations in how deeply we connect to our soul. However, <laughs> we're working on it. We're working on it. That's part of the work that we're doing. Why? Because it's easy to express love when you're looking at a picture of someone you love. But the letter behind the energy behind the letters, I have to work for because I'm in a realm where I wanted to earn the light. And just like it's hard for me to perceive the creator, it's even harder for me to perceive the energy of the creator as channeled by those letters. So, David, you have me, you have me, if you if I may, you have me thinking, right? So you're right in the if I think about the alphabet, the alphabet Gimel, I, when I started this, right, I don't think I necessarily connect or feel, you know, some sort of response or emotional response. And then I just, this moment came to me, but with the 72 names, every morning I look at six or seven of them and meditate on them uh, because I'm connected to them. And I think about it now in the contrast of, but I, I'm not necessarily connected to the other one. Right now, maybe there's something again going on in my life that's caused me to connect to these individual ones. Right. So, again, just the question, there's a different framing of where I can understand it a little better, where I do have a connection to the letters, but I don't have I don't get the individual letters. Right. And that's OK. And because what the 72 letters does for us, since we know the consciousness of that that three letter combination. We're get, it, that's why it's a tool. It's assisting us in connecting to the energy embedded in those letters. I mean, I like to refer to it as a cocktail. It's a three-letter cocktail combination. And like we know, because we've been taught by the teachers who came before us, what energy is coming through those letters, and then it's easier for us to connect to them. And the same would go with, like, I had a conversation with someone before, like, you know, synagogue attendance it's like what's the big deal why we even bother to go why why do we why would we make those connections like you know and our teachers assist us in understanding energetically what what the inner energy is what the internal energy is behind letter combinations and so when we're studying by yigash that first word in the zohar of paragraph one for yigash is how the section, this week's portion starts off with the same word. 
literally came near its confrontation, its invading space. That is the energy behind that word combination. And when we see words with the same letters, but in a different order, and with a different surface meaning, we know the energy is the same at some level because it's the same letters, even though it has a different meaning that it's attached to it based on the sequence of the letters. So the, these are all the tools that we have to open up channels to the inner energy. And it's not just the letters, it is. But it, it, it's also us becoming more attuned to the people in our life, our lives, and their internal energy, their, cor their corrections, their work. And when they show up and we don't have an emotional response, because they're closed, they're not open. So there's all varying degrees of energy that is impacting us that we are confronted with that's not such an easy read at all. And then there's our own energy. Like, why don't I have an emotional response to that picture? Perhaps I have a blockage. <laughs> so what for all of us, the opportunity here and the blessing is for us to be more present in our lives, to be more present to the relationships we have, more present to the circumstances that are going on, to be more present to the bird that stops on my windowsill, to be more present to the sunset and how, you know, the, the light of the sun is like reflecting off of the clouds Towards the end of the day, it looks different than it is during the middle of the day. I mean, it's, it's a different energy there. And it reminds us of the depth available to us in every present moment. Just like our life experiences, and everything that literally is showing up for us. And this goes back to really us confronting our own relationship with the creator. Like, where are we in our interaction with the universe? We and asking why is why why is that so important? Asking why is so important because in a sense it's us confronting our reality. And by asking why, it's like step one in in creating the openings that we're here to process and to work on and to create. Okay. We're out of time. Love Thank you, you so much. Thank Shabbat you. shalom, everybody. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Happy Thank holidays, you. everybody. Thank you. Happy holidays, guys. Thank you. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you.